Hi, my name is Nick. This talk is called In Search of a Cube Cuddle Blame Command. No, there's no cube cuddle blame command right now. This talk is about why there should be one, what it would do, why it's hard to build, and why you should care about it. Let me start with why I care about it. I work on TiltDev. We want to make developing on Kubernetes a pleasant experience. You edit your source code, Tilt updates your cluster. We want to, you to help you understand the progress it's making and how that change is affecting your app. Lots of tools have this problem, and they all solve it in a different way. What does this mean exactly? Let me give you an example. You apply a deployment, you want to check if it worked. One approach to a cube cuddle blame command would trace each cause to its effect and tell you how far along the deployment is. Developers often want this tracking in the reverse direction as well. You know a pod is crashing. Is that pod from the deployment you just created? Or is it from an older revision of that deployment? Where did the different containers and sidecars of the pod come from? When we Tilt Team started down this path, we thought this would be easy. It turned out not to be so easy. We tried a lot of approaches. Many of them failed. It was pretty frustrating. I don't want to put you through that. I want to explain the problem to you in the way that I wish someone had explained the problem to us. Because this problem has old theoretical roots. We're going to talk about those roots. We're going to take a tour of some of the tools that try to solve this problem and how they solve it. And I'm going to talk about some ways future dev tools might make this easier, if anyone here works on Kubernetes. Now, I don't want this to be just a talk about how to write cube cuddle blame. If I wanted cube cuddle blame, I wouldn't have given this talk. I would have used that time to build my own cube cuddle plugin. I'm more interested in the abstract problem and its history. Because if you understand the history, you can make sense of the different approaches. You can reach for non-Kubernetes tools even non-computers for inspiration on solutions. And we might just see better Kubernetes debugging tools in the future. So let's talk about why this is hard. The fundamental Kubernetes architecture is a control loop. The system runs in a loop. You declare a desired state. What the loop does next is a function of the diff between the desired state and the current state. I tried to describe Kubernetes to a friend. She researches history of science. She says, oh, Nick, I, I know what you're talking about. We've been talking about that for decades. Let me send you a paper. She sent me this paper, uh, Origins of Feedback Control by Otto Mayer. Great paper. Old control loop papers typically have a ton of calculus because they're really about functions on differences. This paper is about history. It's tons of fun, very readable, not much math. You probably don't interact with water clocks and windmills day to day, but you do probably interact with thermostats and they have this property that demonstrates the cyclic relationship between cause and effect that we're describing. Let's say the current temperature is 60 degrees Fahrenheit you turn the thermostat to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. You wait a bit, then turn it to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The heat is on. Did the first setting make the heat turn on? Or did the second setting make it turn on? What does it even mean for one change to cause the heat to turn on? The other important part of a control loop is that it's a declarative system. It inherits a lot of the same problems that other declarative systems you might be familiar with. Uh, CSS is pretty widespread. You may be scared of CSS. I was a UI engineer for many years, and I think CSS is great. I think it is one of the great declarative programming languages of all time. 
Uh, when you look at the initial CSS proposal, the inventors of CSS noted that it, hey, it has this nice property. It makes styles very pluggable. It gives you a lot of room to change the implementation and for different contributors to contribute to the style and to optimize the implementation later. The trade-off is, is that CSS, like other declarative systems, can be very hard to debug unless you have a good mental model about what the underlying system is doing. I remember an old story from the Gmail UI team uh, where someone added a bad selector that looked innocent, and that selector killed the performance of the entire page. It took them weeks to figure out why, even to figure out which selector caused the problem. Modern CSS debuggers have come a long way displaying cause and effect. You can see the order the rules are applied in and where they're declared. You can see rules canceling each other out, and you can edit them in place. This is frankly what we should aspire to in Kubernetes land. But now we're going to take a look at what exists today in the Kubernetes ecosystem. The sample app we're going to look at is a stripped down version of Tilt. We build and push an image. We apply a deployment. We track the deployment's progress and wait for the first pod to become ready. Quick review of the life cycle of a deployment so you understand what's going on in these examples. A deployment creates a replica set and the replica set creates a pod. Then the pod is the bit that runs your containers, that runs your code. We're going to look at how these tools differ, the pros and cons, and where they fall down. If you want to follow along, there's a repo where you can run these examples. It's at the bottom of your screen there. The first example I'm going to show you is what the Tilt team did first. Again, we thought this would be easy. Each deployment would get a label. For example, we might apply the label deployed at 10 a.m., January 10th. If you see a pod with that label, you know it belongs to this deployment. Here's what the code looked like. This is the Kubernetes Go client library, client Go. Uh, client Go gives you an object called an informer. An informer handles watching for Kubernetes objects retrying when there's an error, and notifying your code about every change. We can configure it to only watch pods with the label we care about, which is what you see in bold here. Let's watch what this looks like. This is an ASCII cinema video of the tool running. Our code is going to print an update every time the pod status changes. And we see the deployment was a success. All of our examples have a crash flag that lets us see how it behaves when the pod crashes, dash dash crash. So we can watch this deployment come out, and eventually we're going to see it hit an error. Great, perfect, we saw it. So at this point, we thought we had solved the problem. We were pretty happy. Now, this is very efficient. It only watches the pods that matter. We need to inject labels, but that's okay. We can do that for the kind of tool we're building. Then we launched it, and everybody hated this, and they complained all the time. Because we had made a mistake. We assumed that Kubernetes would see the label on the pod template, and would see that that was the only thing that had changed. So it would update the existing pod with the new label. That is not what happens. The, what happens, and the way it's specified to happen, is that the deployment controller will notice that the pod template spec has changed and replace the pod entirely. It was very important to people, we learned, that if nothing changes, the pod should stay as is. It shouldn't restart. And people hated the behavior where it started every time. So we looked for alternatives. The first alternative we will look at is kubectl rollout. It ships with kubectl. The example code that we're going to look at uses kubectl rollout as a library. Let's watch. <laughs> 
So it's going to wait for the deployment rollout to finish. And it's a little bit repetitive, but good, success. It, deployment successfully rolled out. Now, let's look at what happens when the pod crashes. We start the command with dash dash crash. We build and push the image, deploy the deployment, wait for the deployment to finish, and wait. And it timed out. Okay, what happens? When you dig into how Cube Cuddle Raw is implemented, it's very simple. It watches for changes to the deployment. It checks the spec field on the deployment against the status field on the deployment to see if it's finished. Here is the code. Uh, the full function has a few more if branches, but it's not substantially more complicated than the checks that you see here, the checks in Bolt. They check that the number of updated pods is what we expected it to be. What kubectl raw is really good at is understanding deployments. Any information about a pod that's propagated up to the deployment it can find that out. But because of the information we care about isn't in the deployment status, it can't tell us why things are failing. Let's look at a different tool. Let's look at Helm. Uh, Helm also has the ability to track progress. It has two flags, dash dash debug and dash dash watch, that let you track the progress of a Helm upgrade. Just as an aside, Helm, Helm is pretty awesome. If you want tips on how to use the Go client for Kubernetes, I highly recommend you look at how Helm uses it. The code is very readable. The code is very well organized. Of the examples that I wrote for this talk, uh, this was the easiest to write. It uses Helm as a library to watch progress, and it's a couple of lines. Let's watch a video of what it does. Again, we're going to build and push an image, deploy a deployment, and wait on the deployment to come up. Deployment is not ready. Deployed successfully. Great, that is exactly what we wanted. Uh, let's try again with a crashing pod. We're going to apply the new deployment with the crashing pod. Deployment is not ready. Deployment is not ready. The pod is still not ready. And it timed out. Mm. Okay, let's let's try to figure out what's happening. When you unpack the Helm code, what does it do? The Helm code pulls the status of the resource it just deployed. It has a big switch statement of all the different resource types it knows about. It checks their status and it checks their children's status. And it does a type specific check to see if it succeeded. Here's what the code looks like. Uh, it's a bit more sophisticated than the kubectl rollout command. The important bit is the get new replica set call in bold. Uh, we're not going to show the implementation, but what it does is it makes a best guess of what the current replica set is based on the creation timestamp and whether the fields match the deployment. Then it does a similar check to what kubectl rollout does to see if the deployment and the replica set are finished. This is a fine approach. It's easy to understand and easy to reason about. The downside is that there is no universal definition of done. Each new resource type has its own definition in that big switch block that Helm team maintains. Those definitions are easy to add, but still you have to add them. The third alternative we're going to look at is cube spy trace. Now, we're not going to look at too much of the code. I will warn you, the code is very dense. It does a lot, but it's very comprehensive, and you can learn a lot by reading it. Let's take a look at a video of it in action. Uh, unlike the other ones, we're going to pause in the middle of this video just to, just to understand it a little bit better, because there's a lot. Q-Spice Trace starts to hint that blame isn't a straight line. It doesn't go straight from deployment to running pod, we can see the current pod, and we can also see the pod it's replacing. Let's unpause the video and watch it roll out. <laughs> 
Now what's going to happen is that we can see the new pod has become ready and it has replaced the old pod. Great. Now let's look at what it means to crash. Again, we're going to watch it roll out and we're going to pause at an opportune time right here. Now you can see that the current rollout is crashing and it's crashing with the error message container completed with exit code one. And you can see that because the current rollout is crashing, the previous rollout is still up. Revision 10 has not yet replaced revision nine. This is awesome. This is, this is what we wanted. Let's dig into how CubeSpy Trace works. Now the other tools we looked at tracked resources top down. They started with a deployment and look to its children. Cube Spy Trace doesn't do that. If you look at the bold above, it's watching every pod in the namespace. Why? So Cube Spy Trace does both a top-down and bottom-up analysis. First, it creates tables of every type it knows about. It looks at an annotation of the deployment to find the current replica set. Then it looks at all the pods in the namespace and at the owner ref at each pod to figure out which pods belong to that replica set. This seems like a lot of work, but CubeSpy's insight is that you need to do both. The owner references tell you definitively these pods come from this replica set, but deployment is mutable it has revisions, and the owner references can't tell you which revision of the deployment created which pod. They simply don't have that information. To find out which deployment created which pod, we need the deployment controller to pass some information down the object graph, and we need to check that that info has propagated. So this is great. Uh, we have to build tables of resources up front. We still have to do a lot of custom analysis for each resource type. This approach isn't easily portable to other types or to custom resources. I want to briefly talk about what Tilt does today. And it's not that much different than what CubeSpy does. It's less comprehensive than CubeSpy, which does a lot of different checks. Uh, Tilt does use owner references heavily. Every time Tilt deploys a resource, it grabs the UID that kubectl apply returns. It watches all pods, and every time Tilt sees a pod, it climbs the own references to see if that pod belongs to the thing that we just deployed. Now, we still need to do the top-down matching, but we wanted this to work for any type, not just for deployments. So we use a label approach. It's a little bit technical, uh, but I'll try to walk you through it. We inject a label into the pod template spec. They are not random labels, they are, and they are also not auto-incrementing revision labels like deployment controller adds. They're content-based labels. They're a hash of the pod template spec. This ensures that the label changes if and only if the contents of the pod change. And this gives us the semantics we want, where Kubernetes will restart the pod only if the contents change. Now, deployments are special in that they can guarantee that this label will make it down to all the pods. This isn't true for all resource types. So Tilt will check if the label made it down to the pod, and if it did, we will only pay attention to pods that match the current uh, template hash label. Here's what it looks like. Uh, we're going to watch the video, and again, we're going to wait till the deployment comes out, and we're going to pause briefly. Now, when we applied the deployment, we got the UID of that deployment. And we also looked at the content-based label on each pod that we're watching. And we saw that we actually saw three pods. Two of the pods had a content label from a previous revision of the deployment. So we're going to ignore those, but we are going to keep track of the new pod. Let's wait for it to succeed, and we're good. Now for completeness, let's look at what this looks like when it's crashing. Again, we're going to build the image, push the image, 
apply the deployment, ignore the pods that don't match the current revision, and we can see the error of the pod that corresponded to this revision. So this gives us what we need. I am not super happy with this solution, and I'll tell you why. All the indexing and owner ref traversing means this is very complicated, and it's hard to make this perform well. Uh, the, the upside is that it does work well with any resource types. It allows us to track the process of custom uh, track the progress of custom resources. It allows us to properly display events, and events are super helpful for debugging. So I want to close this talk with a small rant if you'll indulge me. I don't want you to come away from this talk saying, oh, cube cuddle rollout is bad, cubist by trace is better, tilt is the best. Uh, all of these approaches have trade-offs. Some are simple and fast and efficient. Some are more complex and give you more information, but are slower. When I was looking at examples for this talk, I looked at cube cuddle tree, uh, a cube cuddle plugin that visualizes the owner reference graph. I laughed out loud when I read this comment directly from the code. Uh, kubectl tree just grabs all the resources in a namespace. It sets the QPS to a thousand so that it doesn't get throttled. And this is not me shaming kubectl tree, because this is what it needs to do. And I hope you see how much that stinks. And it's not because anyone did a bad job. It's because these are inherently hard problems to solve in a declarative system. And to solve it, we need to do some more work. But if the underlying infrastructure gave us a little bit of help and did some things automatically for us, uh, that would make it a lot easier. So what might that look like? Let's start with the bottom-up analysis. What can you figure out when you look at a pod? Right now, Kubernetes gives you owner references, which are good. But there is no API to easily traverse them. Uh, the Kubernetes API is very much optimized for querying types, not for querying graphs of objects, which is good if you're trying to build a controller, like a deployment controller, but not so good if you're trying to attribute blame. Uh, the other thing about the owner references is they don't really tell you which revision did what. Uh, they only tell you which resource it came from. Then there's the other side. What can you figure out if you're just looking at a deployment? What's weird is that there are a lot of common patterns uh, that you see in different resource types. Most controllers have a way to propagate information from the parent to the child to see which revision caused which child change. And lots of controllers have ways to propagate status from the child to the parent. But they all do it inconsistently. They all reinvent the wheel every time, even though we've kind of established the patterns by this point. Uh, and we're getting to the point where it might be worth thinking about what would a generic API look like? What are the common idioms that all controllers should be using for this? Lastly, I want to tease you a bit. The Kubernetes ecosystem is only going to get more complicated. Uh, we're seeing more custom resources. We're starting to see mutated mission controllers, which are really cool, uh, but they modify pods and add sidecars and add volumes and add other things but we can't tell they came from those mutated mission controllers. What would a debugging experience look like that was as nice as the CSS debuggers of today, that lets you see a hierarchy of roles, that lets you see what change each one made, and that lets you uh, attribute blame? So thank you very much for listening to my talk. Again, my name is Nick. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to Ellen Korbs and Sasha Mumbarts who helped me put together this deck and gave a lot of feedback on this talk that helped make it a lot better than what it was at the beginning. I also want to thank all the projects I featured in this talk, Client Go, KubeCuddle, Helm, and KubeSpy. I hope none of them think I was criticizing them because I'm not. I think these are all awesome projects. <laughs>
Uh, and now we have some time for questions. So let's go to the questions. <laughs> 